This video builds on the last video, in which we saw space-time transformations as transformations on a celestial sphere. I claimed at the end that we could instead see these transformations through Mobius maps. Like the action on the celestial sphere, this comes in several steps, specifically three steps. Step 1, we project the sphere onto the 2D plane. Step 2, apply transformation to the plane. For this example, we'll apply a rotation. If you're familiar with complex transformations, if we take w to be our complex coordinate, this can be written as the transformation w maps to e to the i theta w. That is, each point gets multiplied by a phase. If you're not familiar with complex transformations, don't worry. A lot of the transformations we'll see can just be understood as 2D transformations. For example, this is just a rotation of the 2D plane. And then for step 3, we just undo the projection. The resulting transformation is a rotation around the z-axis, and this is a symmetry of 3D space and therefore a symmetry of 3 plus 1 space-time, which leaves time untouched. For different transformations, the only step which changes is the choice of complex transformation chosen for step 2. This time, let's apply a dilatation, or rescaling, of the plane. This can be written as the transformation W maps to alpha W, where alpha is real. The corresponding space-time transformation is the boost in the z-direction, which was discussed in the last video. Now for the last example. Take the complex transformation to be inversion. w maps to 1 over w. What this does is first inverts the modulus, and then reflects in the real axes. We have to be careful with what happens when w equals 0, but for now, I've just cut the origin out. Believe it or not, this corresponds to a half rotation, or rotation by pi around the x-axis. But if I'm to convince you of this, I should go into more detail with the steps. The first and third steps use a specific projection from the sphere to the plane, known as stereographic projection. How the projection map works is you take a sphere and a plane. We fix a point which we'll call the north pole on the sphere. Concretely, we take the north pole to be the point 001 in an xyz coordinate system, while the plane is the xy plane with z equals 0. We obtain a map from the sphere to the plane by picking a point on the sphere, shooting a ray from the north pole through that point, and seeing where that ray hits the plane. With some geometry, we can find an explicit formula for the map. Every point on the sphere has a corresponding point on the plane, except the north pole. It should be thought of as a point at infinity. Under this map, the closer we get to the North Pole, the further out in the plane we get, with the limiting point being at infinity. And this is what I mean by a well-behaved infinity. On the sphere, infinity is just a point, like any other point of the sphere. And side comment, an observation that can be useful for visual sanity checks later, is that the circle of radius 1 on the plane, or the equator of the sphere, forms the fixed points of the stereographic projection. In particular, this contains the points where the x and y axes hit the sphere. Now let's discuss step 2. We viewed the plane obtained by projection as the complex plane, and applied a complex transformation to it. The general complex transformation that corresponds to space-time symmetries are Mobius maps. These are transformations of the form fw equals aw plus b over cw plus d, where a, b, c, and d are complex numbers. Another name for such transformations is fractional linear transformations, because these functions are a ratio of linear functions. Often, we use mapping notation as well as function notation. We can, and you should, check that each of the examples given at the start are such transformations by taking suitable a, b, c, and d. There's one more that we haven't discussed yet, translation of the complex plane. We'll see more of that later. Infinities also crop up here. If c is non-zero, then we can find a w so that the denominator is zero. We define this point as mapping to the point at infinity, denoted by an infinity symbol. In fact, it turns out this is the same point at infinity from stereographic projection. Conversely, we can define the image of the point at infinity. If c is zero, this is defined to be infinity. If c is non-zero, then f infinity is defined to be a over c. Returning to the example where the complex map is w maps to 1 on w, 
We know how the transformation works on each point of the sphere, except the north and south poles. Now we can fill these points in. Under the projection, the north pole corresponds to w equals infinity, while the south pole corresponds to w equals zero. Then the transformation w maps to one on w exchanges these two points. And this agrees with a half rotation about the x-axis. Now here's a question. What is a transformation that is easy to visualize as a space-time transformation, but hard to visualize as a Mobius map? From the perspective of space-time transformations, rotations around different axes are not too different to visualize. But as a Mobius map, while Z rotation was just a rotation of the complex plane, X rotation is much more complicated. Firstly, it displaces the North Pole, so we know that the corresponding Mobius map has a point which maps to infinity. We can take a new perspective which allows us to avoid this problem of infinities. All the transformations we've considered can be thought of as continuously parametrized transformations. For example, rotation around the z-axis is parametrized by a rotation angle, theta. Then we should think about the continuous transformations in terms of a flow as we vary the parameter at a constant rate. One thing we can look at is the trajectories of different points of this flow. These are known as orbits, even if the trajectory is not circular. Another thing we can look at is the flow field, a vector field which generates the flow. And the arrows indicate the speed and direction of the flow at each point. For Z boosts, the orbits are lines going between the poles on the sphere, or on the complex plane, these are lines radiating outwards from the origin. Notice also that the orbits of the Z rotation and Z boosts are transverse or at right angles to one another. This will continue to hold true for rotations versus boosts on other axes. Okay, so now let's return to X rotation. On the sphere, the orbits are circles of constant X, one of which passes through the North Pole, and this is the X equator. There's also two fixed points at X equals plus or minus one, where the x-axis hits the sphere. If we stereographically project, the fixed points end up at plus or minus one on the real axes, and the orbits end up as circles which encircle one of the fixed points, except from the x-equator which lies along the imaginary axes. And the corresponding flow field looks like this. Then the actual Mobius map comes from flowing each point along its orbit at a speed given by the flow field. We can do a similar analysis for a boost in the x direction. As promised, the orbits of the x boost lie transverse to the orbits of the x rotation. And the vector field looks like this. Now for the follow-up to the previous question. What transformation is simple as a Mobius map, but complicated as a space-time transformation? The answer is translation and there's a really surprising answer to what this is as a space-time transformation. A powerful thing about viewing transformations through flow fields is that there's a notion of adding together vector fields, so we can add together transformations. So let's add together a X boost with a Y rotation. Crazily, if the magnitudes are tuned correctly, these straighten out to form a vector field which generates translations. This is by no means obvious. We can do a sanity check to convince ourselves a little more. Translations as Mobius maps fix the point at infinity, the North Pole. If I do a rotation about the Y axis, the North Pole rotates towards the X axis. A compensating boost in the X direction then returns the North Pole to its original position. In the limit of doing many tiny repetitions of this sequence, we get exactly a translation. And that's where I'll leave it for now. I think this topic in mathematical physics is just gorgeous. Mathematically, it lies at the intersection of geometry and abstract algebra. And physically, this is a relativistic theory, but the full picture, which we didn't have time to develop in these videos, also has applications to quantum physics, particularly spinner theory, as well as conformal geometry, studied in the famous ADS-CFT correspondence at the frontier of modern physics. Also, OMG, a hit video. I've just been blown away by the response to my previous video and the kind comments, useful feedback and corrections. So thank you so much and I'm really excited to share more with you in the future. Hope you enjoyed the video and see you next time.